Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 8 says, While we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And I need to figure out which one, which one to pray. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Why will one, why one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, one will dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for us. Have you ever felt in over your head? You find yourself doing things that you don't want to do. You feel pushed by peer pressure to go along with the crowd and you lack the strength to stand against them. When I was young, I was challenged to punch the glass out of a window of an old mill, and I still have the scars to prove it. Weak, helpless, caught up in the crowd, wanting to be accepted, we find ourselves doing things that we know that we ought not to do. Yet Paul says that is when God loved us. That was when Christ was prepared to die for us. We need to understand that at that moment, despite our sin, Despite ourselves, God loved us anyway. While we're still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know people who you could describe as ungodly, and you may have even been like that yourself at one time. You're a self-made man or woman. You don't need God. You might even say, I don't believe in God. I don't want anything to do with you. Keep out of my life. Keep out of my way. Science is my God. Education is my God. We are grown up. We don't need childish beliefs anymore. I don't even believe in Santa Claus anymore. God, you just don't exist. And even if you did, I still don't need you. It was when we felt like that and acted like that, when we behaved in that manner, that was when God loved us. That is when Christ was prepared to die for us. Why? Because we are his creation. God loved us anyway. But God shows his love for us in that while we're yet sinners. I know the concept of sinner is not a very popular word today. It's not politically correct. People say, I'm not a liar. I'm just economical with the truth. From the moral high ground, we say, I'm not a murderer. And yet we find ourselves gossiping. Have you heard about Mrs. Jones? And we end up destroying her character and tearing her reputation to shreds. Sometimes we sin by doing nothing when we ought to have done something or said something. James 4.17 says, If you know what you ought to do, and yet you fail to do it, that is sin. Yet, that is when God loved us. That is when Christ was prepared to die for us. Despite our sinfulness, despite our hypocrisy, God loved us anyway and allowed his son to pay the price for our sins. Weak, ungodly, sinners. Yet God loved us anyway and always has done. But our weakness, our arrogance, our sinfulness places a barrier between us and God. Our sins must be paid for. Sin separates. And God knows we have, to, have got ourselves in a hole and we can't get ourselves out. Because of his love for us, he allows Jesus to take our place, to pay the penalty, the price for our sin. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 7, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. Raised us up with him, made us sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. But God, rich in mercy, out of great love, in which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses and sins. Most of us do not appreciate what God sees when he looks at the sin in our lives. 
We plan sin. We execute the sin. And often we think we've got away with it. And it doesn't seem quite so bad. But when God sees a sin, he sees all the damage that sin has done to us. He sees the inside and all the scars that has left. The wrong word, that vicious act, the arrogant attitude, the destructive criticism. It all leaves a mark on our lives and in the lives of others. Do you like hedgehogs? They may be spiky and flea-ridden, but they're quite cute. We know when we see them the most, it's at the side of the road when they're all squashed and flattened. When you first drive past, you say, oh, oh what a shame. But after a few days, when it begins, begins to decompose and the maggots start crawling through it and it begins to smell, we say, wow, somebody ought to do something about that. It's horrible. It stinks. We want someone to pick it up and throw it out of our sight. It offends us. And yet, that is the effect of sin in our lives. That's what God sees in us when he sees sin leaves its mark upon our souls. And God's response to our horrible, misshapen mess, he reaches out in love and allows Christ to die in our place, that we might be seen as pure and blameless in his sight. And isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous? God loves us anyway. God loves us that much. He made us alive. He raised us up with him. He made us sit with him. What do you think when you go shopping? You're walking down the main street and you see a scruffy looking individual. And even from this distance, you can almost, you can smell him. He's shouting abuse at all those around him, caught up in the madness of his addiction. A wino, a down and out, some would say, a complete waste of space, or even the scum of the earth, nothing but trouble. Do you pass on the other side of the street? Do you get as far away as possible? What would you think of someone who, instead of passing by, took the man home, ran a rose-scented bath for the man, and when it was clean and smelling wonderful, gave him a whole new outfit to wear. Suit, coat, socks, shoes. When he came downstairs, he saw a beautiful dinner. Roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, the big one, not the small one. Apple pie and custard. When he'd eaten his fill and always dressed up, our friend gave him some money and let him go on his way, clean at least on the outside. What do you think of someone who could do that? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he amazing? God has done that and more for each one of us who accepted, accepted, accepted the sacrifice of his son. God has fed us spiritually, clothed us in the king's righteousness, and he has not even sent us away. He asked us to come and share with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Christ has gone ahead to prepare a place for each one of us. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous? From filthy rags to spiritual riches, from sinners to saints, doesn't that show how much God loves us? Does not show that God loves us anyway? And First John 3 verse 1 says, See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Once we were weak, ungodly sinners, and yet God loved us. First John 3 points to the fact that in Christ we have been elevated from those who walk away from God, who want nothing to do with God, to now being those in Christ whom he calls his children. In Christ Jesus, we now have a special, unique relationship with the very creator of the universe. Paul in Romans says we can call him Abba, Father. 
We can speak to God any time, share with him any problem. Why? Because he loves us and allowed his son to pay the price for our sins. Have you ever stood outside Buckingham Palace and wondered what it'd be like to go in and have tea with the queen? You go up to the soldier by the gate and ask, any chance of getting in? He doesn't even bother to reply, just looks down his nose at you and then ignores you. You turn around dejected because you're dying for a cup of tea. It would have been lovely to have tea with the queen. As you turn, you bump straight into Prince Charles as he's coming up to the gate. He says, hello, what are you doing here? And you tell him you would love to have gone in for a cup of tea. He puts his arm around your shoulder and says, come on then, come with me and we'll have some tea. He approaches the soldier at the gate and the soldier does a smart salute and you let you go straight in without asking any further questions. Why? Because you were the one who can give you access. You are with the Son. We are able to approach the throne of God because we are the children of God, clothed in the righteousness of his Son because he loved us and we have given our lives to him in trust and obedience to him. That shows how much God loves us. That shows God loves us anyway. In 1 John 4, verse 10 and 11, it says, And this is love. Not we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Just because we're a child of God, and because he loves us anyway, that doesn't mean we have a license to do what we like. No, because we realize that God loves us, we respond with love towards him by accepting the forgiveness and salvation that he offers us. Our love ought to make us respond by wanting to be the best that we can be. God sees our potential. He wants us to achieve that potential. And therefore, with him on our side and cheering us on, we ought to want to strive to achieve that potential. If we never try, we will never succeed. If we never try, we'll never fail. But if we try and fail in some way, it doesn't matter because God will be there for us to pick us up, to help us to try again. Why? Because God loves us anyway. His love will always be there for us. He has proved that already with the cross. How does God save us from our sins? He saved us by his grace through Jesus' blood. Jesus paid our penalty for sin. Since we're all guilty of sin, we could, take each, we could not take each other's place. Only someone without sin could suffer our punishment. Jesus committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth. Therefore, he was qualified to take our place. The price God required to save us was the blood of an innocent sacrifice. Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. To have the hope of eternal life, we need to believe what Jesus did for us. Romans says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Do you not know that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. God loves us. We must learn to obey God rather than men. May God enable us in the weeks that lie ahead to be the best that we can be in every situation.